Well, thank you very much, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. I've been asked to uh, speak uh, this morning on the uh, the impact of globalism, sorry, the impact of populism, rather, on, on, on our democratic institutions. And I think uh, we've got to uh, acknowledge that the last 10 years have been a very difficult time in every part of the world because of the great financial crisis. I became Prime Minister in uh, May 2008, um, and the world imploded in um, September 2008. So as um, Napoleon said, don't give me a good general, give me a lucky general. Um, I, wasn't so, I wasn't so lucky. Um, but it was a very instructive time and a great uh, period of, of, of uh, growth, if you like, in terms of political debate in, in Europe. I wanted to, to make a few points about it uh, and maybe leave, leave it open to the floor for, for discussion because this is a very important question and one I'm sure that's uh, occup occupying some time here at the Institute for those students who are, who are coming here to, to study. The whole question of populism, of course, or what is it? It's really about after inflection points, major inflection points in, in world history and even in modern history, we've seen reactions uh, to what has happened. For example, if you take the financial crisis, 1929, huge uh, depression, world depression, major uh, political, cultural, and economic developments arose from that. And similarly, in 2007, 2008, there's been a big change in the landscape, in the economic landscape and in the political landscape. And at one level, we shouldn't be surprised at that uh, because there was a serious turmoil in the lives of many millions of individuals when we saw the um, ultimate fragility of the world financial system uh, and how this misassessment of risk and this reliance on algorithms that suggested that uh, syndicated debt could be farmed out to, to the world markets at no risk uh, was proven to be a major fallacy. And the impact of that on the, on the lives of ordinary people should not be underestimated. So the question is, should we be surprised if, as a result of that dislocation, that turmoil, uh, where we see a destruction of wealth, we see a great insecurity brought into pe ordinary people's lives, the loss of their housing, their loss of their, of their jobs, uh, the prospect of old certainties being blown away, um, that the reaction would be come from some people that there were simple solutions to these problems, that we don't live in a very interdependent and uh, sophisticated world. And so therefore, populists uh, fill that vacuum. They feed on that disillusionment <coughs> uh, and that lack of hope. And they suggest from an outlier position that the cozy consensus, as, as they would term it, uh, was a fraud on the people. They speak to, about governments as if they are, you hear it in, in normal discourse, government elites. What is a government elite? A government is representative of the people. It has a mandate. <coughs> It will make mistakes. You can have good government and bad government, mediocre government. And you can come back in a democracy in whatever your constitutional term is, four or five years, and you can get rid of that government and get another one. Uh, but populists suggest are, are, are typical conspiracy theorists. They suggest that there was a conspiracy against the people all the time, that uh, powerful interests uh, have subsumed the public interest, that there is no one, in fact, looking out for the individual on the ground or the citizen, and that the corporates have taken over, uh, that there is a, a false representativeness going on in our liberal democracies. And when you have a disillusioned public, or a public that has been uh, greatly discommoded by what has happened, we shouldn't be surprised if people listen to these rather simplistic notions. In other words, a new narrative takes place, a new, a, new, uh, a new rhetoric takes hold in public opinion. And I really think it's important to have the humility to acknowledge that serious mistakes were made, 
but that in learning from those mistakes, we mustn't misanalyze. We mustn't uh, draw conclusions which will, in fact, lead us down roads or pathways to even greater problems. Because what we're seeing, of course, is this new narrative talking about uh, the fact that it's a me, it's us first generation. This is the new, this is the new uh, rhetoric we're hearing in American politics. America first. In other parts of the world, and in parts of the, in, in parts of democracies where populism is, has always been, but is now is a greater percentage of public opinion. It's about you know, who are we? You know, we, we must ensure that we look after our own interests at the expense of others. That can have a dangerous uh, subtone in relation to minority rights, in relation to gay rights, in relation to individual rights, in relation to ethnic issues. And that sort of xenophobia and uh, layer of racism even uh, can be part of the, the mainstream of politics. Who would have believed that the social democrats in this country would be down to 15% of the population? Nobody. I would never have thought it possible that the great social democratic party of Germany, of Schmidt and of Brandt, uh, would end up where they are today. But it's happened, and it's being replaced by an alt-right alternative that is uh, dangerous. We, we all know we must learn the lessons of history and not be complacent about the present or the future. So from my point of view, the impact of globalism on democratic institutions, even of parliament, of government, uh, must, be, uh, must be fought against. We must find a narrative ourselves for those of us who do believe in the independence of the rule of law, an independent judiciary, individual rights, uh, the right to private property, the right to, for minorities to be integrated into our societies all of these liberal democratic notions which have formed the consensus of Western world values, certainly since the Second World War, the end of the Second World War, for all of our lives, <coughs> and that that has to be reasserted. If we are complacent or lazy, uh, we will allow this populist trend to increase. I don't have a problem with nationalism at a certain level. I was a nationalist. I'm a nationalist myself in many respects. I come from a a nationalist family in terms of Irish politics. My grandfather was a veteran of the War of Independence, ended up in the defeated side in the Civil War. Um, my father was in politics. I, I decided to go into politics at a pretty young age. But all of that commitment to politics was based on this idea that we want to serve. That public service is, in fact, something to be valued. I'm very glad I went into politics um, because I learned a lot about life. I met some very interesting people. I got many positions of responsibility in my country. Uh, certainly made mistakes, but always uh, sought to assess the public interest in our decision making. We have uh, this idea in 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 in. in our modern world that um, we are observers rather than participants. Passivity is becoming the order of the day. When we even walk down the street, our best friend is our phone, as far as I can see. You spend more time on your phone than talking to your children, talking to your parents. People don't even talk around the dinner table. They don't even have dinner at the same time anymore. So, uh, you know, there's a huge amount of passivity in, this, in, 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 in the world we live in. Things are taken for granted. And maybe it's because we are of a post-war generation that we are complacent. We see it in the discussion on European politics today. Um, many younger people becoming disillusioned with, with the European project. And my attitude is, have you ever seen Europe without the European project? Have you any sense of history? Do you have any sense of what can happen uh, when, when, when nations don't cooperate and compete and become me first? Uh, it has been the plague of European history for centuries. And this great um, project that has been devised for all of its faults, for all of its faults, 
is the greatest human experiment in multi-government cooperation that has ever been devised. And there are many who now see it as in decline, uh, to inevitably fall apart. This fatalism I often find very interesting. It demeans the efforts of so many people for over generations to overcome uh, the, repeat, the repetition of history on our continent. And they've done it so successfully with the simple idea it is better to cooperate than to compete and fight. I was, was a member of a government as a foreign affairs minister, as a finance minister, um, in devising a peace process in my own country. Uh, after 30 years of conflict, violent conflict, we devised uh, a peace process that brought an end to, to violence in Northern Ireland by having an inclusive process. Yes, including even some of those who were dismissive of the existing system, educating them into a process of participation so that they would eschew violence, that they would decommission their weapons, that they would take a pathway to peace for the sake of their children, if not themselves, which had been blighted by violence. And now we see with the possible, with the imminent departure of the United Kingdom from Europe, an unprecedented uh, leaving of, of the second biggest uh, economy in the European Union, uh, we see now the prospect of a hard border returning. 25 years after we had brought an example of how cooperation and political dialogue can overcome historic conflict and division, uh, simply because uh, we have this inability to find a way forward on how to leave something uh, that people joined 45 years ago. And why is it difficult? Because we, have, we live in an interdependent and integrated world. It is not easy to just, it's not as simple to walk out and say, I'll take one of the 27 or 8 bricks to make up the European construct, I'll pull it out and there'll be no problem. I'm leaving. It's not like leaving a room. You're leaving um, an integrated, interwoven tapestry uh, of common, in common interests that cannot be easily unwoven without messing up the whole carpet. And people are finding that out now, and they're asking the question, why did they think it was so simple for us to leave? I'm not denying them the right to leave, but I am denying them the right to mess up my country when they leave. <laughs> and I think that's a, a legitimate um, requirement. When you walk out the door, don't bring the door with you. <laughs> um, but I have sympathy, uh, you know, I have sympathy with, with the problem. But it has arisen out of this rise of identity politics, this idea we can do better on our own than with our, with, with our colleagues or with our, with our fraternal partners. In, in a multilateral organization. And of course, that flies in face of the facts. Uh, we do live in an interdependent world. We can be independent. We can, of course, uh, give proper respect to our culture and heritage, our cultural values, our historical national identities. These are important factors because we also have to, have to acknowledge that the citizen doesn't connect with the European Commission as well as he does with his local minister or his local member of parliament. It doesn't mean that the European Commission isn't a valid and important body in the lives of, of the people of Europe. But we do have to acknowledge that we can't decide that the nation state is not relevant. And sometimes the proponents of economic integration have overplayed the integrationist benefits at the expense of respecting the national identities, the natural connections that people have in their sense of community and the sense of the society in which they live. Not as because it's a, a regressive step, but because it's a reality. It's how they feel about where they are and who they are. And that must always be respected. It's a lesson that needs to be learned. But by the same token, it doesn't validate the idea uh, that we can do better on our own. We can't do better on our own.
people are, inter are learning about international supply chains. It's not a question of, oh, let's make it at home so that we can export abroad. They're finding out, well, the product that we're making actually has come in and across our border two or three times because there are five or six different components, and the international supply chain is multinational, not simply inherently national for export to, a, to another third country. So we need to educate our people on the nature of the economy that we live in and the interdependence that, that is fundamental to our prosperity. So when we talk about the impact on our democratic institutions, we are seeing uh, basically a dilution in some cases of what, what we know to be the Copenhagen criteria. The Copenhagen criteria were devised for those countries who wish to join an organization like the European Union, an independent judiciary, adherence to the rule of law, individual rights, recognition of minority rights, and the commitment to multilateral institutions like the United Nations, uh, the focus of the, 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 the source of international law, and its adherence, uh, one's adherence to those, to those principles and norms, and the imposition of sanctions for those countries who refuse to abide by those norms. Uh, if you dilute those basic principles, then you start to deconstruct the pillars upon which your liberal democracy is based. And I think it's fundamental that when we see trends emerging under this populist guise that is starting to scapegoat minorities as the reason for the problem. Immigrants are the problem. Migration is the problem. I'd advise people to read the late Kofi Annan's speech to the European Parliament on migration. It's one of the most <coughs> salient, cogent, and instructive speeches I've read on this subject. And he made it very clear about the benefits of migration. But we must have controlled migration. We must have rules. We must have the ability to uh, in encourage people to come and live in our societies and contribute to our societies. But people want the idea that there's order, that there's rules. Uh, I don't find that incompatible at all. It's a reasonable request. But what we need also to understand is that you can't just simply, simply deal with the symptoms of migration, i.e. the reality that people are coming to our shores, and not ask the question, why? Why are we surprised? If the north-south divide is such that people from North Africa look across the Straits of Gibraltar and see the average income is 30,000 euros and the average income here is 6,000 euros and be surprised why people want to go over here and live a better life. Why, is, why are you surprised? Unless you're prepared to deal with the inequality of resourcing, unless you're prepared to deal with the trade policies that are bringing about those structural inequalities, don't be surprised. And unless there's a quality of political leadership internationally that's prepared to address those issues, don't be surprised. Uh, and certainly don't scapegoat those people who have the same aspiration for a better life as you have a se yourself, but if you're lucky enough to be living in a country that has an average income of 30,000 per year as a thing from five or six and a half. And maybe you learn something from those people, that there's more to life than simply the economy or money, that there are values to about family and about loyalty to one's uh, heritage and traditions. These are important uh, normative issues that it seems to me liberal de liber democracies are forgetting about and we need to return to. And I think it's important too that if we are to deal with these structural inequalities, then there will be a greater sense of trust because what is the big, the big problem is a lack of trust between the elected and those who elect us. And that lack of trust is because there is a questioning as to whether governments are in fact representing the public interest. And rather than decrying that trend, we need to analyze it and study it and be able to answer with clarity. Because if you cannot answer that question with clarity, it is my belief that the rise of populism will continue and the impact of populism on democratic institutions we continue. <clears throat> what are we doing about political lobbies? What are we doing about corporations who are not paying, paying their fair share? What are we doing in the media? We've heard about social media trends. The Wild West. It's a Wild West out there. And no one's doing anything about it as far as ordinary people are concerned. 
because people are preoccupied, most people are preoccupied not with coming to lectures to the Institute of Cultural Democracy. They're trying to raise their kids. They're trying to keep a roof over their head. They're trying to make sure they have a job. They're trying to educate their children. And they're wondering, who's looking after my interests here while I'm spending 50, 60 hours a week trying to make a living to give my kids a better chance? Is there anyone regulating these institutions? Was there anyone regulating the banks? Did anyone know what the hell was going on with all of this financial innovation that was happening? Did anyone understand that there was a total misassessment of risk, that this could, in fact, end up in a catastrophe? No, we all went with the show, myself included. I couldn't see it happening. It happened. And you have to have the humility to say, inadequate on my part. But what we did do, and what we had to do was say, okay, for whatever length of career I have left, and it was three years, I'm going to do the right thing by the country. I'm not going to make the decisions which will make me deeply unpopular, but at least if we get through it, there's some chance that down the line uh, someone will say, by the way, uh, he, he, he did the right thing by the country, even if it wasn't uh, for the pursuit of his own career. And at some stage, you've got to decide, are you a statesman or a politician or are you a careerist? There are too many careerists around. I'm glad to say I don't miss politics as much as I thought I would. Why? Because I found out there's another world out there. Um, because it can be an all-consuming uh, passion uh, for 30 years of my life. But I'm glad to say that, yes, they now, I can now walk down the streets of my country and people nod courteously at me rather than saying other things about me. And they say it because they said, we did come through it. And it was tough. But now we're back in a growth pattern. Now we're back down to 5% unemployment again. Now we're exporting again. We're back on the road. And we've had what people might have called, people like to call a lost decade. I call it a learning decade. A decade to learn certain things, to return to some basic values, and to realize that um, caution and prudence must come back into politics. So I hope that people uh, who are attending this institute, when they go back to their respective countries and their university classrooms, and indeed maybe speaking to some of their university lecturers, that we bring this discussion about what it is we stand for, what it is we believe in, what it is we're prepared to fight for in the, in the forum of public opinion, how we're going to become activists rather than pacifists uh, in this battle of ideas. And uh, modern democracy, or any democracy at any time, uh, from Plato and Socrates on, it's about a battle of ideas. It was about a forum where people met to discuss what is in the communal interest and how do we advance and how do we uh, promote our interests? And how do we live together peaceably, hopefully, with our neighbors? Uh, if we can do that, if we can bring more activism into our democracy, into our democratic life at a community level, then we have some chance of dealing with these scapegoaters and these simplistic notions that uh, it is the other, it is someone else who's the problem. Get a blame game going. Try and ensure uh, that it's not us who are affected, but some poor, uh, weaker individual in society who will be scapegoated for the purpose of uh, gaining political power. So pluralism, respect, uh, being prepared to, to work for a better society at whatever level we are engaged in, whether it's in education or in, in our workplace, whether we decide to join a political organization or be involved in voluntary activity, whatever it is, Citizens will have to m move themselves and motivate themselves to, to participate because without participation, as we see, the void is filled by opportunists who don't have our interests at heart, who really don't, but who see an opportunity to gain power in a cheap uh, and rather unstatesmanlike way. Thanks very much.
to reality related discussions. And people are becoming more serious and concerned about what is happening in our political environment. Now, we have time for a few questions, not many. Well, cultural diplomacy, as I understand it, is about encouraging interaction of different cultural experiences uh, to, to meet and to, to discuss and to see, to recognize how much more we have in common and what differentiates us. Uh, because that is the great way of dealing with populism. Populism is a, is a very narrow, very exclusive, despite its, uh, its very vernacular um, use of language, for example, Trump. He plays the bass all the time. Forgets about the established media. Get the tweets out. Get it out there. Keep keep hitting them with the same stuff. Uh, reinforce the certainties that have given them comfort so far in the short term. Um, it's a new way of doing politics. Um, I mean, I, I, I miss the... the, the um, discussion yesterday where there was a person here who spoke about it was a very good title you know serious media can save the world who can who can save the serious media <laughs> and we don't do something about it shortly um, you know the level of p public discourse is deteriorating very significantly uh, because as I say simplistic solutions are being given to it let's remember in a, in a modern world where attention spans are shortening not everyone's prepared to sit down and go through the complexity of the international financial crisis, and I certainly won't bore you with it, because it broke my heart for about t four years. But you know, how many people want to sit down and analyze it? There's a, there's a, there's a book I'd recommend called When the Music Stopped. Um, and it's a very good analysis of, of the, the whole uh, financial meltdown situation. But uh, again, uh, you know, Complex issues cannot be brought down to a soundbite. And unfortunately, people are attracted to soundbites and quick tweets. I often say, there's a phrase I use, rhetoric has to have a rendezvous with reality. And if culture diplomacy can help ensure that rendezvous happens so that the complexity of lives are brought to bear on the simplistic solutions that people put forward, then there's less chance of a repetition of history that we've seen in the past. Yeah. Well, then if I see global politics in Washington, D.C., and your presentation is excellent, but I have a problem with both in Europe and in Washington when analysis are made about the migration problem. When the analysis is made with the U.S., no mention is made about the intervention of the United States in Guatemala, Honduras, and the Civil War, and so that was another of that uh, migration. And here in Europe, no mention is made about the intervention of Europe and North America in Libya, in all these countries, including the civil wars. Why is this? Well, I mean, I agree. It's, uh, it's clear that po where pools of instability are created because of bad policy, uh, by bad interventionist policy that doesn't have an international mandate behind it, it's a multilateral response to a particular problem. I mean, if there's a genocide going on, if there's a, like what's been happening in Yemen, if there's things happening, we do need international politics to intervene in accordance with international law. But sometimes despots use the idea of national sovereignty as a bulwark against intervention. So this idea of developing uh, an interventionist mandate dependent upon the seriousness of the issues that are happening within a territorial entity is something that international lawyers have been grappling with for some time. And indeed, the United Nations have been grappling with for some time. But I think that you were right. I mean, <coughs> well, it's very simple. Before the fall of the Berlin Wall in this city, when there was a communist uh, monolith here in Eastern Europe, Communism and the free world used Africa as a, pro as, a, as a place for proxy wars. 
Same happened in, 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 in Central America. Uh, and if you're proximate to a great power, uh, where their interests feel threatened or where their influence is being diluted, there will be a reaction. Uh, so, you know, it's important. I, I take the point about the, you know, the migratory flows come from instability. They come from pools of instability sometimes created from the inside and from the outside. It's not a question of the great powers are the great uh, the demons who are causing all the problems. There are serious governance issues, let it be said, within these places. Gaddafi uh, was not a great proponent of individual liberty. Um, there were many people uh, put away in jails for long terms, subject to torture, death, execution, that we'll never know about. So <clears throat> I'm not saying that uh, there isn't a responsibility to be held by people, by nationals, to make sure their own states are run according to civilized criteria. But at the same time, I'm saying that unless we adhere to an international format, then the interventions that we make are more likely to create greater consequential problems than the immediate ones they solve. I mean, the man who died recently, George Herbert Walker Bush, is to be greatly commended for what he did in the, in the Kuwaiti situation. He got a, a 30 nation coalition behind him. He got the United Nations mandate behind him. He went in and ensured that Saddam went back behind his borders. He could have went on and took him out. He didn't, because that would have been it was against uh, the mandate that had been given him by the United Nations. And subsequently, we see that the subsequent policy decisions on Iraq uh, were, were, were disastrous. Again, because there wasn't an adherence to Blint and the guys who were over there looking for these weapons of mass destruction. Uh, and where none existed, of course, it didn't suit the agenda of those who wanted to intervene, so they proceeded anyway. So it's, it's, but populism is more likely to give you unilateralism than multilateralism. I don't see too many multilateral populists around the world. They are interested in unilateral action also. So as I say, we've had good and bad democratic governments, but they can be replaced. I don't see too many despots being replaced, certainly none voluntarily unless they're caught by a mob somewhere and given the, uh, the ultimate sanction. So yes, the migration issue is a, is a complex issue. There's many sources and components to it. But I would still commend uh, the late Kofi Annan, God rest him, his speech to the European Parliament is the most inspiring speech I've read on the subject. Well, I think it is true. I mean, having people in the modern era be members of anything now is becoming difficult. You know, affiliation to church, affiliation to anything outside your own immediate interests, it seems to me, uh, is a circle of virtue that's reducing all the time. For whatever reason, I'm not sure. I'm not saying people aren't good people, but we're becoming more immersed in our own concerns and, exp and we're, we're allowing a sort of vicarious responsibility to be sent to, these are the professional guys who run countries in our country, so let them do it. I just want to get on with my life. I haven't time for this politics. It's the usual old stuff. So that's just lazy complacency of the citizenry. And we're supposed to have an education system that makes us curious. <laughs> it's, supposed, it's supposed to uh, enliven our critical faculties. It's supposed to make us ask some important questions about you know, important things in our lives, like who's running the place. Uh, so, there, so the old um, preparedness to, be, to affiliate, and we're seeing that, I think, <coughs> that's been reflected, if you, if you like, in the multiplicity of parties we have now, in the inability to, for, for parties to gain a level of popular support that would bring us sort of the prospects of a stable government more likely than 
Uh, I'm not saying coalition governments can't be stable, but they certainly take far longer to construct uh, and people sort of disengage. Oh, I, I'm, we had that election last May. We haven't had a government yet till February. It seems like, what's going on? <laughs> so people are, you know, we shouldn't be surprised at the level of this connection if the elongation of the processes are such that by the time we actually get to make some big decisions arising out of the mandate that has been sent out by the electorate, um, that it's taking so long to come to those decisions. So I think, finally, just to say, yes, there is a need for outreach, but there are a lot of, we just need better leadership. We need a bit of idealism, a vision. We need to motivate people to say, look, come with us. We, we, can, we can make this a better place. It's down to political leadership, the quality of leadership in many cases, in my opinion. A vision for the country and a, and a place, and to explain to people you have a place in it. You know, you can't vicariously give that responsibility to someone else. You have a responsibility as a citizen with all the benefits and privileges you have as a citizen to participate in this thing. And now you can't force them. In, in Australia, there's compulsory voting. But um, I think, you know, they're just, I just believe, you know, there come people, people sometimes come to the public sphere who have charisma, who do move people. Um, and I think there's a growing, one of the things we need to think about too is there are a lot of people who I think would be very good in politics in my own country who say to me, you think you must be out of your mind if you think I'm going to submit myself to that level of individual scrutiny. If you're going to submit my family to that sort of, you know, you got to think about that. I remember people saying to me during the height of the crisis in Ireland, I'll finish with this, and I said, my, my eldest was going to, uh, to university in Galway. And they said, your, your daughter must be taking terrible, must be hearing terrible things about you. I said, don't worry about her. I said, she's a clown, she's resilient. She'll fight back. She has something to say for herself. So you shouldn't, you know, I, this idea that we sh shouldn't be subject to criticism, criticize us all you like. But if we could please have a civilized, respectful discussion about it, then there's some chance that either of us will learn something from that discussion. Now, uh, finally, uh, I would like to raise a question which uh, relates to narrative. You say that the narrative is of importance and to change the narrative. And I'm referring to what I'm going to talk about tomorrow when I, when, when in, in, in my speech. And this relates to the term populism. Mm. Now, uh, we remember that in Rome, from our history books, you had the patricians and the plebeians mm -hmm. the plebs. In my political life, I've been trying to be a pleb all my, my life, not, not a patrician. And now we hear this <coughs> word populism, which in our minds, or my mind, is associated with what is popular, the plebs, plebism. Uh, shouldn't we change our narrative here talk about opportunists, talk about fascists, talk about racists, call spade a spade. Yes, I agree. I mean, terminology is important. I thought populism would be a word that might cover all of those for the moment, rather than having a very long title. But I think that, you know, vox populi, vox populi is the, the voice of the people. In the, in the, I remember that from my Latin class, at least. Cistercians taught me something. But they... The thing I would say about, about that is, you see, I am not suggesting that it's not good to be popular. Um, you know, never be a good, you'll never be a good politician if you hate people. You, you got to like what you're doing. You got to like the people you're interacting with. And there's nothing wrong with coming forward with a policy position that gains popular support. What I'm simply saying is, that what has to underlie, what has to underwrite that position is a genuine interest in the public interest, which is not necessarily the short-term benefit, but will have, a in many cases, a structural reform that will bring a greater sense of sustainab sustainable prosperity in the future. That will mean that this generation has to take some hits now so that we have a better and more stable future for the next generation because of the nature of the turmoil we've experienced. But the populist that I'm talking about is the guy that says, no problem. 
it's not really a problem. You know, forget about these guys. They're, they're, they're old hat. You know, two and two isn't four anymore. <laughs> Just add the knots later. I mean, the point I'm trying to make is that populism in the sense of appealing to the base instincts of people rather than to their higher values and sense of who they can be at their best rather than at their worst. That's my definition of a populist, the guy who goes, there are more who listen to the simple a panacea than uh, appealing to them, to their better nature to, to overcome the problem at hand. Thank you very much.